Time to either hang this up or bring one home. So obviously, again, so there are going to be many people misled thinking that's you asking yourself very much out loud, you know, the thought of retirement. So that isn't you on Twitter. That's not me, no. And there is no specter of retirement on the forefront. Very cool. So Chris, fresh Ooh. off your five time, of your fifth rather, Classic Physique Olympia title, but you received some more monumental news recently that you are about to become a father. Baby Bob, there we go. Baby Bob. Thank you. Take me through it. When you first hear you are about to become a father, what goes through your head? I mean, I'm grateful that all I felt was excitement. And I know my wife, Courtney, was happy that I felt excited too. It was unexpected. And I found out right at the beginning of my bodybuilding prep, which most bodybuilders know is very unlikely to conceive a child at that point. But it's something that's always been a dream of mine. I talk very openly that I'm very excited for the next chapter of my life to be a father. And you know, I've, I've learned a lot of, in this beautiful journey I've had. And I would love to pass that down to my children. And now having that opportunity, to build something, a human being with my wife Courtney, is just the best news I could have ever received. It was greater than any Olympia titles and we're super excited for the journey. Well, I'm gonna give you some advice as somebody who became a father about five years ago. I'll need it. Amazon.com <laughs> and Target. Those two websites are about to become your absolute best friends. Target has curbside pickup which is gonna come in very clutch when Beautiful. you can get diapers at about 11.30 <laughs> p.m. I, I'll just use Instacart. There you go. America, they just bring it right to my door. <laughs> you are just weeks removed, three weeks removed from winning your fifth Classic Physique Olympia title. And you, know, you look around this room, adoring fans in the Middle East. What a journey it has been for you. Not only winning five Classic Physique Olympia titles, amassing over 20 million followers on Instagram. When you sit back, reflect, do you ever paint yourself like, this is real, this is really my life. I mean, I have that moment almost every day. It's been pretty crazy, it's been a long journey, and one of the things I'm most grateful for is the people behind me, and I've had five years to learn just how important they are and how I couldn't have done this without them, and how it wouldn't have been as enjoyable without them. So, you know, some, a lot of people will have climbed to the top, win at a title, win something big, and then they get one chance and they're done. I've had five years to be able to get better at it, get better at experiencing it, get better at being more present and enjoying it rather than stressing about the outcome and being able to have those moments with my family. So it's been really beautiful and a lot of fun. I just remember back to 2018. That was the second year that the Classic Physique Division was at the Olympia. Uh, I mean, you're talking about when Danny Hester was coming in as a defending champion and King Kamali. I remember on one of our shows, he was talking about Arash Rabar and how he came in second this year and saying, look, this next year's competition is going to be a lot harder. You have dudes coming out of the woodwork. You have this one guy from Canada, some good-looking guy named Chris Bumstead, who's supposed to be pretty good. Now, you win the Toronto Pro, clinch your ticket at the Olympia. You step on that pre-judging stage, and I remember Dave Palumbo said it then during pre-judging, this guy could win this division for the next 10 years. But I want to take a step further back. You entered this sport... Uh, as a bodybuilder, as an open class bodybuilder, at what point did you decide that classic physique was the right fit for you? Was it somebody who made a suggestion based off your physique? Was it something about the division, the old school, the golden era that inspired you? What made you choose classic physique? I mean, I've always been more inspired by the look of classic physique bodybuilders from the 80s and 70s and such. And honestly, in 2016, when I turned pro as a bodybuilder before Classic Physique was out, I was close to retiring because I knew being six foot one, I would have to be about 300 pounds to be a competitive bodybuilder. And I know there's health risks that come with that and everything else that comes with that. And it wasn't my goal to look like that either. So I was feeling like my career was about to end. I was in college at the time and I was going to start a normal career path. And then the division came out and it was just like perfect place, perfect timing. And 
something that I've done my entire life is when an opportunity arises, the door opens, I take it no matter what, especially at a young age. I'm like, whatever opportunity comes my way, I'm going to take a risk. And when I do it, I'm going to go all in on it. And it felt just perfect timing. I didn't know what my next lineup for me was going to be. I didn't know if I was going to retire bodybuilding or what. Class D comes out. I'm like, I might as well try it. I'll give it a shot. And then I jumped in it and it just felt right. You know, I won Pittsburgh Pro, Toronto Pro, got to the Olympia and came second in the first year. And that's when I was like, wow, like, I can really make a career out of this. And I felt like I had gone all in and I'm like, if I really want to become Mr. Olympia now, I'm going to have to push aside everything. I took a risk. I dropped out of college. I called my mom and I remember being like, mom, I know you really want me to get my degree. I can always go back to school, but I think I'm going to go all in on this bodybuilding thing. And she wasn't super happy with it, but they know the work ethic I put into everything I do and they believed in me. So they supported me through it and I made it worth it. You know, when you, when you take risks, you gotta make sure that you're gonna put 110% into what you're doing and not kind of spread it out or do a half-ass anything. And they believed in me to do that. So that helped me. Next thing you know, second place in next Olympia, but I had some health issues that came on and I wasn't ready to quit yet. And then after that, five more Olympia titles and I never looked back since. And it was all because of that risk I took and putting everything into it. When you think back to your first classic physique Olympia title, and I remember it, 2019, and just to show you how different things were back then, I remember I interviewed you at the Meet the Olympians, 2019, there might have been two people in front of me online before I got to speak to you. Fast forward two years after um, in Orlando, your line went around the entire Meet the Olympians, and obviously, you've gone on on this dynastic run. I remember in 2019, you talked about wanting to bring something truly classic to the stage. And when I asked you after you won the title, if you felt like you did that, you said yes, you were pleased with what you brought. This division has evolved. Classic physique has evolved. In your opinion, what has evolved about the standard that you set back in 2019 that you continue to set during the course of this run? I mean, the entire division is a whole new division. Like you said, if you look back at Danny Hester, the first class of Vidic Olympia, to now, it's crazy. And one of the most challenging things of being a champion is that you're not chasing anything or anyone. There's no goal you're looking towards. So when I won in 2019, I was the best at the time, but if I looked like I did in 2019, I would have lost the following four Olympias. I had to keep improving, and the only way to do that when you're at the top is to be beating yourself. There's no goal, nothing you're chasing. You have to kind of create what other people are chasing. So I had to kind of find the ways to motivate and push myself and just find that internal drive of being a better version of myself rather than beating the guy in front of me. There's no one in front of me. So in 2019, when I said I wanted to set the standard, I believed I did that, but I wasn't done. I had to keep setting my own standards and beating myself every single year to keep evolving. And I mean, people have been chasing at my heel for the last five years and it hasn't been easy. As you can see, people like Ramon and Urz, even Breon's still up there in the top five after six years. So it's been really fun and you know, they push me from behind, but at the end of the day, I gotta keep beating myself and kind of paving the path forward. It's funny because we just had Ronnie Coleman and Phil Heath on this stage just a few minutes ago and they were talking about how their rivals pushed them to be better. How Jay Cutler brought another level out of Ronnie Coleman, how Kai Green brought another level uh, out of uh, Phil Heath. You mentioned the rivalry between you and Breon Ansley and now it's developed where Breon is still around, Terrence Ruffin is still around, but now you have two young guns in Oroz Kalasinski and Ramon Dino nipping at your heels. In the evolution of your reign at the top of the Classic League division, how have these rivalries, obviously you're competing against yourself, but how have these rivals forced you to take it to another level? I would probably say the number one rival who pushed me at the beginning of my career was Breon. You know, he's the guy who beat me twice at the Olympia, and I, the third time I was like, fuck that, this guy's not beating me for a third time, he's done. And, you know, that was one of those things where he brought out a lot of my weak points in my physique. He was shorter than me, he had strong back and strong arms, and a strong, he was a little bit, had more width than I did. And I was like, all right, if these are all my weak points, this is where he's beating me, I gotta make those my strong points. And now, from the side, my arms have improved a lot, but my back has come up a lot. My side chest is one of my strongest poses, which used to be one of my weakest. So just him pointing out my flaws and showing me where I need to improve on really pushed me to be better. And he was a great athlete, you know? He pushed me and made me a lot better. Since then, it's been between him, Urz, Terrence, and Breon, so there's not one specific person. But I understand that Classic Physique is such a cool division because people really young can come out of the woodwork, like I did, out of nowhere, and just be the next top guy. So you never know who's going to come out, and that's why at the end of the day it really does have to be me just pushing my own limits every single year. 
you know, when you look around this room here at the Dubai Muscle Show, uh, it, have you been to Dubai before, right? Yeah. As far as these, yeah, right. Uh, obviously, much has been made about the social media presence, but you look around not just this expo, not just this region, but worldwide. I have cousins in England who idolize you. I have friends who they know nothing about bodybuilding, but they know Chris Bumstead. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, because I think this is very profound as far as, you know, we talk about the word inspiration. There are many people today around the world who go to the gym because they saw a picture of you, because they follow you. They will take their shoes off and walk around in their socks in the gym, just like you. You know, for all that you've achieved on the stage, when you think about there are many people going to the gym to better themselves, to improve their health, to bring out the best version of themselves, all because they've been inspired by you, what does that mean to you? I can't really put it into words how much it means to me. And honestly, the I don't even know how to explain it. The most gratitude that I feel in my heart is when it comes from people who have mentally shifted their life. Because I know a lot of bodybuilders get into the gym because they're depressed, they're anxious, or they're a little insecure of something. The gym is a place where they can feel confident and build that confidence. And then, you know, I've had my own struggles in the past and I've put a lot of effort into sharing them as best as I can. I'm very open and vulnerable online. You know, life's not perfect for anyone. And the more I share it, I get a lot of people that come up to me and be like, man, the fact that you're Mr. Olympia, you're doing what you're doing on stage and you're telling me that you were anxious, you were scared, you cried, you wanted to quit, like, gave me the strength to feel like that's normal for me too and continue to be like strong and push myself even though I have these hard times. I think those are the most impactful moments for me and I know a lot of pro bodybuilders who are struggling a lot mentally behind the scenes and feel like they're alone and they can't share it and I know that me putting it out there helps a lot of people and I have a lot of kids, especially this Olympia this year, some kids wrote me notes because they couldn't tell me how they were feeling in words. They sent me messages, their moms were coming up to me saying what I've impacted them. And I cried so many times leading into the Olympia with them sharing these messages to me because it just, it meant the world that not only am I inspiring people to get jacked and build more muscle, but I'm reaching people in a way that I'm helping their mental health a little bit, giving them a little bit of motivation to be a better version of themselves, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, relationally in their life. So that's something that I can't even put into words. And the number one thing that motivates me to keep doing what I'm doing and keep excelling in all aspects of life are those moments that I get to share with people where I, I feel that impact that I've had. Well, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, 8 p.m., it's a couple of doors down. I don't know the exact hall, but it's a couple of doors down from here. We're gonna have a Q&A session, so it's gonna be a good two hours Q&A with Chris Bumstead. It is a ticketed event, so if you haven't already bought your ticket, do so before leaving because I cannot guarantee that there will be tickets available tonight at the door. But, you know, Chris, we talk about social media and uh, there was a little controversy last week or so. Now, confirm this yes or no. Are you on Twitter? I'm not on Twitter. I actually tried to report that account because I'm like, this, there's a Twitter account with 500,000 followers that's not me. And I'm like, damn, that's a lot of power. They could say anything and people think it's me. So I tried to report them and Twitter won't let me take it down. Because so. it was about a year ago that you had a exchange with uh, Andrew Tate. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself like, oh my God, Chris Bumstead's going tit for tat with Andrew Tate. And then what happened last week, for those of you wondering what, what controversy I'm referring to, this account on Twitter, which it says Chris Bumstead, posted a picture, this picture of you holding up a medal, and it says, time to either hang this up or bring one home. So obviously, again, so there are gonna be many people misled thinking that's you asking yourself very much out loud, you know, the thought of retirement. So that isn't you on Twitter. That's not me, no. And there is no specter of retirement on the forefront. I mean, there always is, you know? Anything could happen anytime, but I'm just taking it day by day, so. I've said that for the last three years, though. You know, I don't know how long I'm gonna do this, but for now, I'm just enjoying another win and taking it as it come, you know? Finally, What's next? The reason I ask that is because you consider everything that you have amassed on the stage competitively. You're the face of a supplement company, Raw. Again, I go to the gym and I see all these people wearing brands that you've represented. I see the, the young, young LA here everywhere now. And I wonder to myself, what is your big picture 
and when you think about five, 10 years down the road in terms of maximizing, leveraging this platform that you've created and you've seen all the good that you've done to this point, is it as a businessman? Is it to maybe open up some fitness related ventures to help people? Is it to have one day maybe even have your own contest? What do you see as your long-term big time post-competition? I mean, if you can think of it, I probably thought of it. I thought of more businesses, more shows, more competitions, more everything. I've thought of it, and I might do it all, but the biggest thing that drives me right now is my excitement to be a father and going in on all, going all in on that, being the best husband I can be. And I want to leverage my platform, but I want to leverage it as best as possible to try and give back to the community that has helped me and to the community that has taught me so much mentally. I want to find a way that I can like express and share a lot of the knowledge that I've received that has made me so much more happy and present and enjoying my life so much more. I want to find a way to give that back to the people who have supported me throughout this journey. So I'm still trying to work that out. I have some ideas. But you know, as a competitor, so much work goes into it. There's the business side of it, so much work goes into that. So it's probably gonna take until I retire in a few years. So hopefully by then I have that concept and then I'll run with it, but it'll be good and we'll figure it out when it comes. One last question, and I say this in a very positive uh, manner. Despite your popularity, despite your success, you have remained outwardly humble. There is a sense of humility with you that I think makes you relatable to everybody here, people who follow you around the world. And I, I can speak for my cousin who talks about just, he follows you, but he's just like this guy, as big as he is, he just seems so down to earth. Is he really like that? And I'm like, look, in my limited interactions, he really is like that. Where does that come from? What has allowed you to stay grounded and so humble despite all that you've achieved? I would say it's a perfect combination of the way I was raised. I have two amazing parents who never gave a fuck about status or money or success. They just wanted me to be a good human being and they taught me to be as such and that's one of my biggest values. And I surrounded myself with good people who have valued me for who I am as a person rather than for my success and as a bodybuilder. So when I'm at home, when I'm at work, when I'm doing anything, I'm not C-Bum, I'm just Christopher. You know, I'm just Chris, no one treats me differently and I'm not different, I'm not more special than anyone. So it's not like, I have to try to be, it's just, I have really good people around me who wouldn't let me change if I wanted to, and I was raised to be the man that I am, and I don't ever plan on changing. Well, Chris, I can say this for everybody here who has been engaged and hanging on to each and every one of your words, and for the people around the world who follow you, who are inspired by you, for the bodybuilders, the aspiring bodybuilders, the aspiring fitness enthusiasts who have bettered themselves because of your inspiration, I say thank you continuing to do all that you do, all the great that you do, and most importantly, continue to be yourself, and I would say even more importantly, enjoy all that fatherhood is gonna have to offer. It's a great journey. I experienced it five years ago. I can tell you firsthand, it's the greatest thing you're ever going to do, and I can tell by that smile on your face when you talk about becoming a father, yeah. you're going to be a great one. Thank you, I appreciate it, I'm very excited. And thank you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, tonight, 8 p.m.